Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Uh, Today, I'm excited to have Kate Giles, author of Jesus Untangled, on the show. And he is going to speak about the growing entanglement of the Christian with the state, which is the basic premise behind the Bad Roman Project. Also joining us is Abby Kleckner, contributor for the Bad Roman Project as well. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, really good. Really excited. Oh, doing great. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Can you tell me a little bit what about what inspired you to write Jesus Untangled? I mean, where were you at politically Whenever you, when you you chose to write this, were you done with politics at the time, or had you something you've been thinking about for a while? Yeah, it's something. I mean, I I kind of had my own sort of journey through um, entanglement. You know, I, I was very very entangled growing up, and um, I think I've talked. I think I talk about this. I don't know if I talk about this so much in detail in the book, but you know, I was raised Southern Baptist. I was. Uh, you know, I was I voted Repo- straight ticket Republican at the early as soon as I could, and uh, you know I was a member of the NRA and I loved Rush Limbaugh and all that, and so I was really really entangled for a long long time. Slowly, I feel like the Holy Spirit was just kind of like pointing out to me how this entanglement was not a good thing, and how it really how it was in conflict with my desire to follow Jesus, and recognizing that the kingdom of God and the American dream are not the same thing and they actually are opposed to one another. So the more I started processing that, uh, and I sort of w- went through my own kind of process, um, but it took me a while though. And so I think what I did initially was I rejected sort of the conservative Republican version of Christianity and political entanglement. And I swung the pendulum over to the liberal side. And that was right about the time Barack Obama I uh, was running for president, so I voted for him uh, the first time. And But then I started noticing immediately that it was exactly the same thing. You could just trade out the, you know, trade out the, you know, the, the subject and the, and the verb, but it was the same thing. You know, it just it went from being um, you know, demonizing liberals on the conservative side to now demonizing conservatives on the liberal side. And it was still tribalism. It was still something that was entangling my faith with politics. And it was still, I recognized it still wasn't a good thing. So then I just, that's when I backed out all together, you know, but the whole time I was very aware of how many of my friends and family members were uh, very, very entangled between faith and politics. And that's why I decided that I needed to write the book uh, to kind of tell my story, but also to try and help us kind of wake up from the American dream. Yeah. I have to say, had had I read your book, uh, Maybe not even five years ago, I would have been infuriated with you <laughs> I, because it, it went against everything that I believed. You know, I I voted straight line party Republican since George W. Bush until 2016 when Donald Trump was nominated. And that's when I kind of woke up and realized there's something wrong. And then just like you, I started comparing the two parties and they're, they're the same, mm-hmm. except I didn't go towards the liberal side. I started, you know, looking out like a third looking at third party candidates like libertarianism and spent a lot of time trying to convince people that the two party system was broken, Mm. but nobody, you know, and they would pay attention for a little bit, you know, after the election, but the longer it got away from the election, they lost interest. And then they went back to Fox news or CNN to get their news from. And it just makes it worse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would say I, I was already an anarchist when your book came out. But I I came at it from like a very much like bitter, resentful place, like, oh, the government's just ruining everything and there's nothing we can do about it. And I think reading your book um, brought me much more to like a hopeful mm. place of like, well, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, yes. like political power. Psh, what's that? I don't need to worry about that. Like what I have is so much bigger than that. Mm. So it really kind of turned around my perspective. And that's what really like struck me in the book. I remember the first time I read it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I I was going to say, Abby, I think you got it. (laughs) Because (laughs) what you just said, that's exactly what I was hoping people would come away with. The, The understanding 
that this grasping for political uh, influence and power, which is one of the worst things that I think we can see happening right now with a a lot of um, evangelical Christian leaders just compromising everything they say they stand for, you know, to fawn over and support and prop up someone like Trump because they want this political influence so badly, this power, this political power so badly. And what, but it's, um, it's been not recognizing, this is what I want Christians to understand, that the average Christian, like your grandma, like an eight-year-old kid ha- who loves Jesus and who understands, sees the kingdom, has more power than the president of the United States of America to change this world. And I want us to get that. Like we, so I think, I, I don't know if, I don't think I say this in the book, but, um, but in general, it's sort of like the, the, I guess I would, one of the ways I've been trying to summarize it to people is like the best way to, to, um, to remove power from the church is to convince the church that she doesn't have any power. Um, and that's kind of what's happened, right? Yeah. The church has so much more power because we have the Holy Spirit. We have the, the gospel of the kingdom. We have the ability to transform people from the inside out into people who look and love and behave like Jesus, which is lasting. And, you know, it's something that will one person at a time literally change this world. Um, and, and yet we are so easily distracted from that and we start seeking political power. And we, actually the, it, the trap is, that that political influence and power, we won't change anything. I promise at the end of it, you'll still have a huge political empire and nothing will have changed. And and not only that, um, we will have failed in our mission and we will have, we have accomplished really nothing. And if anything, we're the ones now who have been manipulated and compromised. We've just be- sold ourselves into slavery to this, to this machine that just wants to use us and spit us out. That's what I think. That's what, what what my biggest frustration with with Christians is right now, is and I, and you speak, you know, like your your grandmother or your you know an eight year old child, you know, I, I I think most of my family and friends think I've gone crazy, yeah. you know, <laughs> and they and they've they they themselves are Christians, but when you point out, I mean. You can look no further than a, a Franklin Graham Facebook post. Uh, I try not to, but you're right. <laughs> well, I try not to, too, but, you know, sometimes I feel a little ornery and I want to get on there and, and say, but this is what Jesus said. Mm-hmm. And you guys are falling all over yourself to, you know, God bless Trump, which, listen, I understand we're supposed to pray, you know, but you're not supposed to worship these people. Right. You know, if you saw, if you, if I saw Christians, you know, worshiping Jesus the way they do the state, I'd be a whole lot happier. Yeah, yeah. This would be a whole lot better, a better world to live in. Yeah, you know, and I think that's where my frustration lies is with the absolute adoration for a flawed man that's been put in power. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I'll say, and I, I think I said this one time on Twitter or something. I said, um, you know, I just wish that Chris, I could find Christians who love Jesus as much as they love the Second Amendment. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Because, I mean, I, I get way, way more, I see way, way more passion, uh, you know, and reaction to someone who dares to say anything about the Second Amendment than I do anything to do with Jesus. Um, and it's because, and, and again, it just sort of like reveals like, well, yeah, what is it you're really passionate about, right? Like the whole idea that, I mean, this is one of the things that I noticed in myself when I was going through my own um, untangling. Uh, process was that I recognized that you know what I was at a pl- I was at a place where I realized I would gladly engage in an hour long debate with a total stranger about politics in line at the grocery store, but I wouldn't talk to I wouldn't spend five minutes to talk to that same guy about Jesus. I think I remember I don't know if I read that or where I saw that at, but I remember you saying that, and I, I was like, that sounds like me. Yeah, it's but it's very true, and so you know once I realized that about myself. Um, and again, that's what I was trying to do with the book was to help other Christians who were in a, in a similar situation to see it now. But like you said, Craig, you know, like you said, like four or five years ago, if you'd have read my book, um, you would have been angry and upset and you wouldn't have received it. And see, I, I also recognize this as well, that um, not everybody's really in a place where they're ready for that, right? Like, so, um, I mean, if someone's really, really deeply entangled, 
it's very, very difficult to show them that they are, right? What's that quote like Mark Twain or something like, it's much easier to deceive people than to convince people that they're deceived? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's really true. Like you almost need to already have in the back of your mind some doubts about the system or about, you know, the entanglement uh, for for something like this to even help you in any way. Because if you are fully convinced, then, I mean, I know just even from, from my own family members, I unfortunately, I have a couple of family members uh, who loved me to death until they read this book. And then now it's like, they don't even know how to talk to me, right? They're really upset wow. because they are so entangled and still are. And that's really sad to me. Where do you think, where do you think the disconnect come from? I mean, what, what is, what has happened? I mean, why if you can, you can, you can say the words of Jesus in one breath and then turn around and support these ongoing wars in the second when mm -hmm. Jesus was very, very clear about how he felt about all, you know, loving your neighbor. And I mean, that includes those people over there that were, were dropping bombs on. Yes. Newsflash. <laughs> I mean, those, those, that's God's creation. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Not just Americans. God didn't just create America. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, that's a good question, Craig. And I think it's, uh, it is a delusion. Like, I think we have to understand that if, when we were that way, we were kind of, we were under a delusion, right? We were sort of brainwashed. We, we bought into some things we were told as children that we grew up believing. And, you know, it takes time to kind of detox from that and to, to get that out of your system. So I, I feel like um, one of the reasons why I think some Christians can can still remain in that place is that I think you have to still hold on to certain lies. You have to fully embrace, 100% embrace the lie that America is a Christian nation, um, to believe that America is some sort of special, you know, place in God's plan for the world. Um, so that's one thing I've noticed, like, cause that's one of the major things that if you try to, if you try to challenge that idea that America is a Christian nation, that you'll get a huge fight. And, um, and I think the other one is tied to it. This is why my second book after I wrote Untangled was Jesus Unbound. And the second one is this idea that the Bible was something that God wrote and, um, you know, dropped out of the sky bound in Corinthian <laughs> leather. And, uh, you know what I mean? And so... Those are the things I think that help kind of keep people trapped in that, in that place. Um, I mean, I, I tell a story, I think I in the beginning of the book, it's either, it's either the introduction or the first chapter. I can't remember, but there's a, I tell this story, which is not unique, not original with me. I'm retelling a story, but it's a true story about a, a American soldier in world war II, uh after the battle of the bulge. And there, uh, there were, we had no capabilities to care for the wounded or to or to take in uh, prisoners of war. So literally, this guy's job was to, after the battle, he was walking through the battlefield and just shooting anyone dead who was an uh, enemy combatant. You know, these were Nazi soldiers, German soldiers. And as he's going through, he sees a man, a, a, a German soldier, leaning against a tree. And he's not even wounded. He's just exhausted after the battle. So he goes up to the man with his rifle, and he's going to kill the man because this is what he's supposed to do. And then the man looks up and sees him and in English says, please uh, let me, give me a, a moment to pray. And so he, he kind of takes a step back and he goes, oh, you're a Christian. And the guy goes, yes. And he goes, well, I'm a Christian too. And so the, he sits down next to the man. They both pull out a Bible. They read scripture together. They share pictures of their family members and, and pray for one another's family members and have this really beautiful moment together as really now recognizing what they have in common, that they are brothers in Christ. But then after they're finished praying, the American soldier stands up, cocks his gun, points it at the German soldier and says, I'll see you in heaven and blows his brains out. And that is such a, <laughs> a tragic, tragic story, but it illustrates, I think, better than I could even imagine. It illustrates this idea that American Christians are under at a delusion. In other words, what could supersede in a Christian's mind that basic, simple connection with another human being as a brother in Christ to make you say, I'm going to, I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to kill them. Why? Because my 
my country tells me, my nation. So it's this nationalism, this tribalism, where we identify more, we are more American than we are Christian. Yeah. Right. And that is one of the fundamental problems that I think we have. And as long as we see ourselves, when we say we, I think I talk about this in the book, when we say we, uh, we need to stop and think, okay, what do I mean? Do I mean we, when I say we, do I mean Americans? Okay, well, now you you're you have a different frame of reference. But understand that the early Christian church for the first 400 years um, had no we except the body of Christ and the kingdom of God. And, um, you know, this was the whole thing about Jesus as Lord is the idea that Caesar is not right. We have no we have no king but Christ. I mean, this is this was the the battle cry and the death cry of martyrs for hundreds of years, starting with uh, the followers of Jesus all the way up until the time of Constantine, that um, they saw themselves as people who were part of a kingdom now that stood in opposition to the kingdoms of the world. Um, I want Christians to kind of go back to that, to come back to this place of originally seeing ourselves as we have a king, we have a nation, he has a plan to change the world, and it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with the, the nation we happen to be a part of. Well, that's a, that's a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk to next, actually. The, so in, in your book, you reference, uh, I guess I found it in the back of the book, it's a book called The Early Christians in Their Own Words. And I'm probably going to abuse this guy's name, Everhard Arnold. No, you said it exactly right. The older I've gotten, I've been, become more fascinated with history. And now... We have the Bible, and we see how the Christians in the Bible, their attitude towards government. But we didn't have much beyond that. So you, you quote Tertullian. Am I saying his name right? Yes, that's right. I love this guy. I mean, I don't know. I don't, everything that I've read about him, he, he seems like no nonsense, you know. And I want to read a quote uh, that he, he wrote in a letter that he wrote to the Romans. He said, In us, all zeal in the pursuit of glory and honor is dead. So we have no pressing inducement to take part in your public meetings, nor is there anything more entirely foreign to us than the affairs of the state. What happened? Where did we go wrong? I mean, they, these guys still, they were still following the way they, they you know, like you said, with no king but Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you're exactly right. And there's another Tertullian quote I love. He says, um, he says, yes, and the Caesars too would have believed on Christ if either the Caesars had not been necessary for the world, or if Christians could have been Caesars. So like, there's this major disconnect in their minds between what it means to be a follower of Jesus and someone who is a still part of the uh, the systems of the world, right? And so, yeah, I, I love Tertullian when it comes to this topic. By the way, I, I hate to break it. I hate to burst your bubble, but I had mine burst as well. But Tertullian is awesome when it comes to this, uh, all of the quotes, all of his writings, when it comes to um, Christians and the state and nonviolence and following Jesus and the two different kingdoms rule. Don't Please don't read anything he says about women because it's horrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I do love him when it comes to those things, but man, he had, he had some other things that were really screwy and backwards and not very Christ, not very Christ-like. But this on this issue, he was very right. And so- we have people like Tertullian and Origen and all these church fathers, Irenaeus and guys like that, Athanasius. And um, in fact, we have a you we have a, a unanimous uh, voice in starting from the apostles all the way through uh, like the first three hundred, roughly four hundred years of church history. Not a single dissenting voice who said anything positive about being a part of the empire. Who said anything positive about using violence or being part of the military or part of the government. In fact, there was a very, very strong sentiment throughout the early church that if, if you came to Christ and you were a soldier or you were a member of the government, you were not allowed to enter the meeting, to share communion, to be baptized as a follower of Christ unless you renounced those things. So yeah, it was this two kingdoms idea. And so what changed all that? Well, when Constantine, who was Caesar at the time, had a conversion experience, at least that's what he describes. But it, but the crazy thing, I mean, you can tell it wasn't a genuine conversion experience just by the context of his, the experience. His experience was 
that he was going into battle and he saw a vision in the sky of a, of a, of a cross and he heard a voice tell him, by this sign, you will prevail. And so he had all the all of his soldiers paint crosses on their shields and on their chests. And they went into battle and slaughtered a bunch of people. And hallelujah, Jesus must have been a part of this. So obviously, Constantine had no idea who Jesus was. Well, that's still going on today. I mean... Well, of course, you yes. Know, we're, the, we're, going to, uh, we're going to the Middle East to kill right. these people because, you know, they don't follow Christianity. I mean, I'm not saying that's exactly why, but they view Muslim, Muslims as antichrist, which, you know, we could debate that all day long. Well, no, that was, I thought you were going to say there, and you knew if you saw this story, there actually is a company that was inscribing, I, I guess they were selling weapons to the U.S. military, but with, with scripture verses inscribed in the weapon, in like the machine guns and in the rifles. Oh my gosh. No, I didn't see that, but it doesn't surprise me at all. It's exactly the same idea. So Constantine, I, I really don't believe he had a genuine conversion experience um, because, because if you look at his life, even after he supposedly you know, had this conversion experience and came to Christ. He was never baptized. He never submitted himself to any anyone in his life who was a sort of a, a teacher of, of a scripture. He didn't really become a student of Jesus or a disciple of Jesus. Um, he had his wife and his son put to death for a ridiculous thing, like not for legitimate reasons. So yeah, he, he was uh, someone who I don't think really ever understood who Jesus really was. He sort of made Jesus in his own image, or the, the image he wanted Jesus to be, which was a conqueror, a symbol of really the empire, a symbol of power. But at the same time, he became a friend of the church, and he helped to end persecution of Christians. And because of that sort of trade-off, a lot of Christian leaders uh, at the time suddenly decided it was okay to, to have a Caesar. Uh, in addition to Jesus, to say, well, Jesus is Lord, but, you know, Caesar's kind of okay co- uh, now, too. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's really it's really sad and frustrating. Like, when I, when I studied that part of Scripture, initially I was really depressed that, like, it didn't seem like anybody objected. Like, how did, how did everyone just fall for this? And the truth is, it, if you keep looking, you find, actually, that there was a minority of people who didn't play along, who actually said, no, we this is not right. We can't. We can't be a part of the empire. And um, so many of them became the desert fathers, and they're also the desert mothers, who actually literally left society, left the city, went off and lived in the desert to completely remove themselves from the empire. Sounds like a bunch of anarchists to me. (laughs) Yeah, actually. (laughs) Wow, yeah, I'd never heard that before. Oh, yeah, it's a really interesting thing. So they gave me a lot of hope. It was like, okay, good. There were some people who uh, who sort of said no. We're not going to play along. Uh, but the sad thing was the church in general at large did play along. And that's where we really, Christianity has been entangled with the state pretty much ever since. I think it's so interesting that it's like once um, Christians felt like they had some ownership over the state or the empire, that's where the entanglement began. And I feel like America has done such a great job of that with democracy because people feel like they have control and they have ownership over this governmental system. Um, And I really, uh, I know in the book you talk about how that's kind of an illusion. It's we, our votes aren't actually statistically significant. Oh yeah. Um, But yeah, it's really like a big trap of people thinking, well, this is my government. The politicians work for me and, but it's not really true. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That is that was actually one of the probably the last straw for me in my uh, untangling myself from politics was recognizing the fact that really my vote doesn't count and it is an illusion. I mean, I'm not sure if our government ever really truly was a government by the people for the people and of the people. Um but even if it was, it isn't anymore. Like and that's something statistically provable. Like it, we, uh, there, there were studies done, I referenced one of the studies in the book that was research done by Princeton University. So it was 20 years of data and they were answering the question, does the U.S. government represent the will of the people? And what they found was the correlation between the issues that American citizens supported and the likelihood of that idea being legislated was zero. So basically what they said was uh, it made no difference whatsoever. Now, that's that's shocking enough in itself, but what they did find was there was a group whose opinion about a particular issue absolutely influenced 
whether or not it would be passed or not passed in Congress. And this group of people were billionaires and corporations who are lobbying, spending, you know, millions and billions of dollars in lobbying and, and getting back trillions of dollars in uh, benefits because of the things that were passing. And now the f- most frustrating thing about that is so that the people, that's you and me, who paid the bulk of the taxes have no representation in government, but we're the ones voting for those guys and even supporting them financially, you know, sending in our money to their campaigns. And we have no voice in the government. They're not listening to us. They don't care what we want. But then these corporations and billionaires who who do not pay taxes, right? Amazon paid nothing in taxes and they make billions of dollars in profit. But those guys have all the representation and pay nothing for it. So that's, that's for myself personally. And again, I'm not trying to tell anybody you shouldn't vote. I'm just saying for me personally, when I realized this, it was like, I'm not going to play this game anymore. I'm not going to participate in this system anymore because it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for the common person. And then then really again, backing it up and recognizing again, Jesus is my king. He has a kingdom. He has a plan to change the world one person at a time from the inside out to change their hearts and minds, not pass laws, because passing laws won't change anyone's hearts or mind about anything. But the kingdom, the gospel does, right? And so I, it's when I finally just said, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to just, I'm going to abandon all of my faith and hope in politics because I can see it's never actually accomplished any of the things we wanted it to and put all of my hope in Jesus and in the kingdom of God and say, this is really, I think, the only thing that has any potential and hope of changing me and then the world. Going back to when the religious right aligned itself with the Republican Party, when Reagan was running for president, you know, and they started with the uh, overturning Roe versus Mm -hmm. Wade. That was 40 years ago from whenever you wrote the book and you call it a shiny red button, which I, I completely relate to because when I first started voting, I had no idea what team I was on, but I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. I was against abortion and Republicans were talking about abortion, you know, doing away with abortion. I was like, all right, I'm going to do that. Well, not what less than two years later, I was a (laughs) neocon because nine 11 happened. And I spent a lot of my time after that advocating for more war. You know, George W. Bush said, we got to kill them over there before they kill us over here. They still talk about abortion and they still do nothing Mm. about it. And it's just like you said, you can't pass a law. Jesus doesn't want to pass the law. You can't legislate morality. Well, and that's the thing. Like the reason I call it the shiny red button is that I I just had that realization, which I go into more detail in the book. But, you know, I just as a Republican, and I've been doing this a long time. You said you started with George Bush. I started with Ronald Reagan. And, um, and I recognize that, yeah, this was, this has always been the battle cry, right? We have to overturn Roe versus Wade. We have to end abortion. Yay. Everyone cheers and we all (laughs) vote, but then nothing happens. And then we're even recognizing that, you know, we had a, we had a Republican majority in Congress. Uh, we had two terms of Reagan. We had, uh, George W. Bush. We had, uh, George H. W. Bush. We had, uh, you know, all these, all these Republicans, in and presidential power, and at the same time, at different points during their presidencies, enough Republican support in Congress and Senate that if they had wanted to, they could have made at least a run at actually doing the thing which they say is the number one thing they care about, which would be to overturn Roe v. Wade. And there was no attempt. They didn't even try. And then I realized the lights come on and you realize, oh, because this is the best thing ever. If what you want to do is use it to get people to vote for you, then why would you fix that problem? Because the minute you fix it, now you've got nothing comparable, right, to to, to charge people up and to get them to, you know, to vote for you. Well, well, well that reminded me, like in 2016, you know, when Trump was elected, they had a majority in Congress and they ran on an, uh, ending Obamacare and to mm-hmm. stop funding Planned Parenthood. They're still doing both. Funding the Planned Parenthood has increased under Trump. <laughs> right, right. And yeah, and then actually with go back to Reagan. So the thing about Reagan was he did the same thing. He ran on this platform and we must overturn Roe v. Wade. And then the one of the first things he does is he nominates Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court. And she was a liberal justice. And not only was she a liberal justice, every time something came up, um, 
in the got to the Supreme Court level that had anything to do with abortion, she cast the swing vote that pushed it back towards pro-abortion. Like he actively did things that made sure that abortion would remain the, the law of the land. He did, in other words, he did the opposite of what he said he was going to do. And and the, those see, seeing that kind of a thing, you know, you start to realize, okay, there's some smoke and mirrors going on here. There's one thing being said to the people, but behind the doors, there's actually something else going on. And there's and I, I quote this book quite a lot in my book. It's an excellent book if anyone's curious about this topic. There's an excellent book called Blinded by Might. And um, oh my gosh, what a phenomenal book is. It's written by two guys who were under Reagan. They were the, the sort of the right-hand men of Jerry Falwell. Cal Thomas and um, I think the other guy's name was McDowell. Not Josh McDowell, but there was another guy. I can't remember his first name. But anyway, they co-wrote this book together um, and basically just say we were played like violins. Like we fell for it as Christians. We believed that if we helped support Reagan uh, and, and support the Republican Party, that they would help us, you know, uh, do the things politically that we wanted them to do. And then they just exposed it how they would say one thing during the campaign and then once they got elected – you know, they did nothing. And that actually they even admit that they did more harm than good uh, by getting Christians entangled and, and part of this machine, because now they just handed all these Christians over to the Republican Party to, you know, charge them up and get them to donate money and, and support their political machine. And they really are not and still are not interested in actually doing anything that they say they're interested in. I think it's also very interesting, like I can say, all of the presidents elected in my lifetime have been at least somewhat anti-war on the campaign trail. Yeah. But yet every time, no matter who is elected, the war increases every single time. Right. And like pe people in this upcoming election are trying to say, oh, this candidate's going to end the wars. This candidate's going to end the wars. Right. And it's like, man, I've heard that before. Don't hold your breath. They have no interest in, in ending the war. I mean... There's, there's, there's too much money to be made in war. Thank you. Thank you. See, this is what I want. I really wish Christians would get is that when we go back to the, the block of the, this group of people that actually do uh, influence the government, like who does the government really benefit? Who does it, the government really work for? Well, it benefits these billion dollar corporations. And, and the, a lot of them are, uh, you know, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, you know, people that are getting multi-billion dollar contracts to build weapons that we don't even need because uh, we already have. And then this is the insanity to me. I mean, we keep running, these presidents, they keep running like, I'm going to strengthen the military. We need it. Like, oh, what are you talking about? We already spend 10 times as much as every other nation on the planet. <laughs> Like we have, it's an un, unreal, it's unimaginable how how crazy, you know, the our, our military is, the, the weapons we have. It's just ridiculous. But we continually run on this platform that like, like our military is a bunch of guys with, you know, sticks and guns that they were made in the 50s. Do you think this is based off of fear though? I mean, I mean, if, if, is it, is it from fear? Yes. Yeah, see, fear is the main thing that. We have to, we used to manipulate people. Well, I was, I, have you ever seen the movie Green Lantern? Yes. Okay. It, it was happened to be on this morning whenever I was getting around and the guy talking, he said, they feed off of fear and their power grows off of that fear. Power just grows and grows and grows. And you see this in mainstream media. It's all fear based. If this guy gets elected, this is going to happen. Well, it's already happening. Yeah. Well, that's so why I have, I have an entire chapter in Jesus Untangled chapter 10, which is, it's called the power of fear. Because I want people to see that. I want, is exactly right. I want people to notice how um, you are, people are using fear to manipulate you. And really, when I see Christians, and I see this a lot on Facebook, Christians playing into this fear, right? They're sharing memes or news stories or links to articles. It's all about, you know, we need to be afraid of the Muslims. We need to be afraid of terrorism. We need to be afraid of the, the liberals. We need to be afraid of, uh, you know, whatever. Like, it's, it's always fear-based. And the sad thing is, is when Christians buy into fear, when Christians are motivated by fear, I mean, again, you are denying everything the gospel is about. Perfect love casts out fear. So why are you being motivated by fear? You have not been given a spirit of fear, but of love, 
right? And of a sound mind. Like, so stop being motivated by fear. Stop watching news that that only, you know, tries to get you, uh, put you in a place of fear. Because once you're in a place of fear, you're not rational. You're not actually thinking clearly. And um, if you're perpetually in a state of fear, uh, you you are very easy to manipulate. I mean, it's just it's just the way it is. And so I want Christians to recognize that this is part of this system, part of the empire, uh, part of what it means to be kind of someone who's plugged into that. Uh, I mean, fear is the one of the number one. I mean, it's even the power. I mean, think about even the power of the state. Well, the main thing that the power of the state has over the average citizen of the state is um, the power of the sword, right? They can arrest you. They can put you to death. Um, right. They, they, this is the threat that they have over you. This was exactly the same threat that, that the early church had. Right. And yet they opposed the empire without any power, without any protection, without any civil rights or any of those things. It was like, you know what, you can kill me if you want to, but I am following Jesus. And, um, that's what we need to get back to this idea of like, we're not afraid of death. We follow the Lord of life, the resurrected King. We are, you know, that's why we even start the process. We should start our relationship with him by dying to ourselves. We already took off our cross. We've already experienced this dying to ourselves. And so, uh, and we've already resurrected into this new life of Christ. So there's nothing here that has any power over me. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of the state. I'm not afraid of any, they have no power over me. I, I said something similar to a friend of mine. He goes, so you're just sitting around waiting to die? I'm like, no, I'm not sitting around waiting to die. Good grief. That's ridiculous. Right. Right. It's just that I'm not fearing death and I'm not allowing any of those, any of the fear that the, the, the empire wants to hold over me to manipulate me or control me or silence me. Yes, I love that. Hey, folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, and send us an email at the Bad Roman Podcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. This has been a lot of fun. I want to, uh, you've got three other books, Jesus Unbound, Jesus Unveiled, and Jesus Undefeated. And Abby has, has read all three of these books. I haven't had a chance to yet, but she's got some questions, and hopefully we can kind of tie them into Jesus Untangled a little bit. All right, get ready. <laughs> like, obviously, Jesus Untangled came out first, and I was wondering how uh, untangling yourself from politics has affected your spiritual journey in general, and did that push you to kind of examining these other parts of American Christian culture, or was it kind of the other way around, or both at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of had um, this major epiphany in my life, probably. Gosh, probably almost almost ten years before I wrote Jesus Untangled, something like that, and it was this big this big shift in my mind of I grew up believing that the gospel was about saying a prayer so you can go to heaven when you die, and then someone blew my mind and said, "Well, actually, no, that's not the gospel. Jesus ever says that. It's that that doesn't appear anywhere in the gospels. If you read the gospels, right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus himself tells you what the good news yeah. of the kingdom is." Uh, it's this idea the kingdom is here now, and he invites us to follow him and to live in the kingdom today. I don't have to wait till I'm dead. And so that was a major, major paradigm shift for me. And and that it, that is the major sort of shift in my spirituality that kind of set everything else in motion, the ripples that came out of that. You know, I feel like the Holy Spirit through that experience showed me mm-hmm. my entanglement with politics. So I, I, you know, I, I deconstructed that. And so... I wrote Untangled first, really just because, I guess around the time that this was leading up to the Trump, you know, the, the, the campaign with Hillary and, and Donald Trump, this this kind of entanglement was make, reaching this fever pitch. I have a really good friend of mine, his name is Ross Rohde, and he, he private messaged me 
And he's like me. He's like, Keith, I'm losing my mind here. I just, I'm trying to talk to Christians on Facebook Mm -hmm. and I'm quoting Jesus and they don't get it. And they're not listening to Jesus and they're more controlled by their politics. And and, and I'm just, I said, you know, man, I feel your pain. I said, why don't we, you and I just write some, uh, a series of blogs together. And so we did. (laughs) Uh, I think he wrote two of them, two or three. I wrote like 13 or 14. And after I wrote all those blogs, I, I realized, well, you know what, especially based on the reaction that I was getting to those blog posts, I realized, you know what, I feel like this is, this is such a big, big issue. I need to write a book about it. So that's why Untangled was the first book I wrote <laughs> on this kind of issue. And then the reason I wrote Unbound next was there's a chapter early on in Jesus Untangled where I kind of just say, look, I, so that you understand how I approach scripture mm-hmm. and where I'm coming from, let me... Let me just explain to you that I used to hold a flat Bible perspective, but now I hold a Jesus-centric perspective of Scripture, and I briefly explained what that was and where it came from. Yeah, I remember that part really blowing my mind, too, where I was like, oh, I don't, like, I think I think all of the Bible is equally authoritative and important, but I don't actually act like that, so I should probably make a conscious decision of how I interpret what is authoritative in the yeah. Bible and what I want to model my life after. Yeah. yeah. And so because, I mean, I just kind of wrote that chapter on Untangled to sort of uh, help people understand where I'm coming from. But then honestly, I that, that was one of the number one comments I got from people from Untangled was like, man, what's this flat Bible thing, man? Jesus-centric thing. Like, I never heard that before. Yeah. And, and it was so much uh, positive, really, response from that. Like, I realized I need to expand that whole thing into a, its own book. Because then the other thing I realized is that the other entanglement I see with Christians is with the Bible. Like I literally Bible worship. Like I, I would run into people on, on online Christians, right. Who would literally, like, I would, I would agree with what they were saying. If what they were, if they would just say Jesus instead of Bible, but they don't, they act as if the Bible will change your life and the Bible will do all these things, you know, and then like, no, it's, it won't, it's a book right? It, the book won't do any of those things. No, Jesus will. And I recognize it wasn't just a semantics. Like They really are attributing things to a book that they should be attributing to Jesus. And so they were had a relationship with a, with a book about Jesus, but not so much a relationship with Jesus. So that's why I wrote Unbound, was to kind of hopefully correct that. Yeah, definitely. That was something I was very convicted of, of like, oh, I have a relationship with the Bible more than I have a relationship with who the Bible is about. And um, yeah, still, I I run into so many Christians who are saying, well, if the Bible is not all, I don't know, equally true or inerrant or however they want to say it, then there's nothing to base our faith on. And it's like, well, what about God? Isn't Mm -hmm. (laughs) it? Isn't that what we base our faith on? I don't know. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, it's that all or nothing approach, which I think, again, we've inherited it because the pastors from the pulpit will say that all the time, the whole of the Bible and say, every word in this book is absolutely true. And if any one of it's, if any part of it's false, the whole thing is thrown out and like, what are you talking about? Like, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where it's really hard. It's a, it's a really a psychosis. Like I, I. Sometimes I can just go round and round and round with Christians on this whole thing with the Bible where, you know, I'll say, look, the Bible never points to the Bible. The Bible always points us to Christ. And, and you know, I, I did a little thing where I did like a little, a little uh, quiz that I posted on one of my blog posts. And I did, I'll do it on social media too. And I'll say, you know, take this quiz, you know, um, like a Bible quiz. Let's see if you can pass this quiz. What is a Christian's ultimate authority? What is the foundation for the Christian faith. And so again, most of the time when I ask questions like that, Christians will respond, what's our ultimate authority? The Bible. Uh, What is the foundation for our faith? The Bible. It's like, nope, sorry, you failed the test. Because actually, if you read that Bible, in the Bible, Jesus says all authority has been given to him, to Jesus, not to the book written that we wrote about Jesus. Um, Paul says that our foundation is Christ, and no foundation can be laid except for the one already laid, which is Christ. Uh, and there's several other questions like that I, I, I ask people. It's like, that's what I'm talking about, where, where we will point to the Bible rather than to who the Bible points to, which is to Christ. And it's really difficult sometimes to help Christians break that 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 kind of blind spot or psychosis or whatever. It's like, it's almost like if I say anything, they'll say, well, Keith, you, 
that that came from the Bible. You wouldn't even know that if it wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Right. But by going to the Bible and following what the Bible says, the Bible tells me not to follow the Bible, but to follow Jesus. Yeah, but that's in the Bible. Yes, <laughs> it is in the Bible. But please, are you under? Are you listening to what it's saying? It's so. It's like we we kind of like replace uh, authority. We put the Bible in the place of that of in the wrong place, where really Jesus is the one that should be. Right, in that place. and I think it's so similar to with the state, where it's like, well. I don't know, I guess putting my trust and faith in Christ, it kind of seems more abstract where if I have a book yeah. that I can put my hands on, or if I have a government that is with full of people that I can see and I can listen to, that seems more certain to me and more of a sure thing. So that's what I end up putting my faith in. Yeah, exactly. And I, and you know, some of the pushback I've received from people about um, the Jesus centric way of looking at scripture versus the flat Bible way of looking at scripture is, you know, they'll say things like, they'll point out, they'll say things like, well, Keith, what you're saying is dangerous because if we just listen to the Holy Spirit, if we just trust the Spirit, we could get off. We could do, we could believe crazy things. We could get it wrong. And I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, like we would never do that if all we did was just believe this one book <laughs> that we wrote, right? Because that's never happened, right? Christians have never. Exactly. It's like we're all reading the People same. People never use the Bible as a weapon. No. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, if we all just read the Bible, we'll all come up with the same answers, right? So why are there like 30,000 Christian denominations in the world? But we're exactly. all reading the same book that's so clear about everything, right? So look, so again, <laughs> I mean, I'll admit, I'm not saying that if we start with Jesus and if we're led by the spirit that we'll never get it wrong of course we will that the human capacity for getting it wrong is endless we will yes of course we can get it wrong i'm just saying if we follow christ if we start with him and our, we make it our goal to abide in mm -hmm. christ and so that christ abides in us and we we have a connection a direct connection with jesus that's what the scriptures tell us to do that's how we're supposed to start that should, that's the actual starting place of christianity and and it's not, again, that we're not going to get it wrong, but I think we have a much better chance of getting it right if that's where we begin. And that's where we, you know, we kind of live our Christian life out of that place rather than, well, my pastor said that this verse yeah. means this. That's great. I love that. Um, which of your books do you feel like uh, you got the most pushback on? And which do you feel like you got the most positive response? Yeah, I mean... I'll be honest, I think with every book I've published, I've always expected, you know, when I publish the book, I always think, I tell my wife, Wendy, I'll be like, well, this is it. I'm done. You know, they're going to write me off. I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be called a heretic and uh, they're going to, they're, they're going to throw bricks to my window or, you know, it, it's, it's over. Uh, but, it, but it hasn't been, I mean, I, not that I haven't gotten pushback. <laughs> I certainly have. Um, for the most part, I'm thankful to say that uh, most of what I've heard from people are, I get emails and messages from people who say, thank you, who say, wow, you've put into words something I've believed for a long time or didn't know how to process or whatever, uh, or express. And so for the most part, I think I've received uh, a lot more positive response, but, but of course I have gotten a lot of negative response. <laughs> I think I've probably been called a heretic for, for all of them. Um, I've lost family members over untangled, <laughs> uh, and unbound, uh, I had friends actually tell me not to write Unbound uh, because that's, you know, kind of touching touching the Bible was sort of this no-no wow. thing. And I do have some strained relationships with some friends uh, in ministry over that book. But but you know what? Here's the thing, though. Uh, it's it, The people who do kind of push back against these books, most of them have not read the book. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, what they're pushing back against is the thesis. They're the thesis of the book, the idea of the book, and that's what they're pushing back against. But my thing is like, just read it, because because honestly, most people who have read it uh, will come back and say, even if they don't agree with me, well, okay, Keith, but you know what? At least I understand where you're coming from. Right. I mean, I may not agree with where you landed, but at least I understand how you got there, and I can see how that makes sense. You know what I mean? In some way, I would say also reading each of the books, like I I've gone into them like it, like yes, I expect this to be a critique of this certain topic. But what really comes through is just how much you love Jesus and how much um, you're letting go of this thing so that you are better able to follow Jesus. And I feel like I shouldn't be surprised by that. I <laughs> but when you would go into a book expecting it to be a critique about a certain aspect of the culture, 
And then you're hit with like, well, no, this is totally coming from a place of love and out of this relationship. I always come away from your books feeling really positive and hopeful about that stuff. Thank you. And again, that's something I, I try really hard to do. And if there's a theme running through all of my books, it's that. It's that I, I'm pointing out things that I feel that we have put in, in the way of Jesus or, or other people have tried to put between us and Jesus. And I want to, I want to kind of show us that, oh my gosh, we put politics between us and Jesus. We put the Bible between us and Jesus. We put the church or, or we put um, views about hell or things like this um, where it's, it's, it's distorted or obscured our view or understanding of who Jesus is. And so that's what I'm trying to do with each of these books. This is why it's the Jesus Un series. I'm so like I'm wanting to undo some things that I feel have been <laughs> yeah. done. Um, and I hope when it's when it's over, that's my goal, is that when you read the book at the end, you love Jesus even more. You're excited about knowing Jesus even more. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so of all the books, I assume that, I mean, it sounds like they were all things that you had like really believed and then kind of wrestled with and ended up letting go of and changing your mind on. Um what do you feel like was like the most freeing to let go of, the most beneficial thing to let go of to, for your relationship with God? Or I don't know, maybe they all just kind of built on each other and you can't pick one. I mean, I think, yeah, they. I think it's more of that they've all built on each other because it's, you know, it was an incredibly mm -hmm. <clears throat> beautiful and freeing thing to finally untangle myself from politics because I, I don't, I'm, I'm not as negative and I'm not, I'm not stressed out all the time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's very, it's very toxic. You know, the whole political thing is so toxic. Well, it makes Christians ugly. I mean, it, you don't even look like a Christian when you get entangled with that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It makes us behave in very unchrist like ways. Um, but, you know, when I when I had the epiphany about the Jesus centric way of looking at scripture. And again, that came about by studying uh, the reformers and uh, the Anabaptists, because that was one of their main disagreements and, and the way this one one thing that kind of set them up against one another was the reformers calvin and luther and those guys yeah. took a flat bible approach and the anabaptists took a jesus-centric approach and and as i kind of saw the two different ways of looking at scripture the anabaptist one just made so much more sense to me and then it made so many other things about the bible make sense like oh that's why this is oh okay that makes sense so um that was incredibly freeing to me uh that kind of i think helped me to feel so much more confident in that it's okay to follow Jesus, uh, even if sometimes it seems that what Jesus is saying might contradict something else that I read in the Old Testament or something. That's okay, because I'm following Jesus, and He's the Lord, and no one knows the Father except for the Son, and to the, you know, the one to whom the Son chooses to reveal the Father. So I'm going to follow Jesus. He's the one. He's the, he's the one I'm supposed to follow. The house church thing uh, was a massive thing for me, I think, walking away from traditional churches and that sort of control structure of, of like hierarchy and church and things like that. Well, I'm sure when, when you had picked that as your career to walk away from that's a really big deal. <laughs> it was, a, yeah, yeah. That was a big thing. Uh, for the first year I, I didn't have a full-time job because I'd left ministry. Uh, I was doing temporary work for a year until I finally found a job that would support my family. But yeah, but, but the thing I, giving up that as a career, like sort of church as a career was hard, but the trade-off was beautiful because it was the first time I really experienced like real koinonia, like true fellowship with God through fellowship with other believers at the same time. There was kind of this beautiful symbiotic kind of thing that was happening. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. So that was beautiful. And then, you know, the book I just wrote recently about the three, the three views of hell. Oh my gosh. What an amazing thing to, to now recognize that God is better than I thought he was. He's not going to roast his children forever. Um, you know, he's actually more like Jesus. His goal is not, he's not looking for reasons that he can, uh, you know, torture me or beat the sin out of me or whatever, uh, that he loves me and he wants to restore. So, so it, it, that was beautiful because it changed the way I looked at God and it also changed the way I see other people. I think it, it freed me up kind of abandoning the eternal torment view and moving more towards the universal reconciliation view. Uh, it made me realize that God loves people more than I do. And I don't, all I have to do is love them. And I can relate to other human beings just as a human being, rather than sort of this Christian versus non-Christian kind of posture. And um, yeah, that was, that was also been a very beautiful and kind of freeing experience. I so relate to that. And, and back to the whole fear-based thing of, 
letting go of that view made me realize how fear-based my faith was. And when I looked at the people around me in my life, I was constantly afraid that, well, they're not believing the right thing, so God's going to punish them for that. And like almost the tribalism too of like, they have to be in my tribe or they're going to be tortured or, you know, like yeah. it's just crazy how much the fear and the tribalism kind of like permeates so much of our world and how hard it is to see all that and let go of it. There's going to be a lot of surprise Christians in heaven. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of surprise like, Christians. They're here. How did that guy get in here? Right. <laughs> well, I spent a lot of my time in church in, in the Southern Baptist church yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and it was, it was, it was fear based. And I'm this whole uh, idea that Abby was just talking about is is fairly new to me. I'm coming around to it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you there, Craig. Well, you know, read that, read my books. Yeah, <laughs> read my book. I've got them right here on my desk. I plan <laughs> on it. But Abby, you have anything else? No, that was all my questions. I'm so thankful that I got to ask them all. This has been awesome. Oh, thank you guys. Thanks, Abby. Thank you, Craig, so much. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. It has been a lot of fun. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to plug? You said you got a new book coming out. And- yeah, yeah. So, well, if anyone wants to hear more of this insanity, you can follow me. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my blog is at Pathios, but you can get there by just, uh, it's my, you can go to keithgiles.com and that'll send you to my Pathios blog. I do a podcast called The Heretic Happy Hour with two other crazy guys who don't agree with each other, but we love each other anyway. Um, and I do have a new book that hopefully will be out in a couple of months. It's called Square One, and this is different. So it's not part of the Jesus Un series. Um, it's, a, it's a book based on a 90-day course that I put together, and we're going through the second round of it right now with, a, with about 15 people in the group. Course is designed, and the book is following this idea of helping Christians who have deconstructed their faith go through deconstruction and find a foundation for reconstructing their faith. Because I just was noticing there's a whole lot of stuff out there dealing with deconstruction of faith, and I could not find very much at all focused on reconstruction. And I want to help people move through deconstruction into a place where they they feel like they can come into a much better place spiritually and a kind of a healthy place where they can connect with God and connect with Jesus in in a way that is putting them on a better path that's more positive. So that's what Square One, the course is all about. It's a 90 day course, but then the book, I thought, you know, let me let me kind of boil this down into a book format so that people can just read it, see if they can find themselves on this map, figure out where they're at in this journey, and hopefully give them some tools to help them also find a place, a foundation for faith to move towards reconstruction. I really appreciate you guys taking some time with me today. I, I wanted to add also on Jesus Untangled, I've read that you at your home church, 100% of offering goes to the needy. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I was like, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so that's kind of what inspired what we're doing with the Bad Roman Project. Any donations to the show will be going to charities here in Memphis. So I'm really excited about that. I was like, I don't want to do this for me, but I'd like to, you know, help some other people with it. Right. Well, that's beautiful. I think that's really, really awesome. Well, I hope we can do this again sometime. Maybe when your new book comes out, we can have you back on and talk about it a little bit. Let's do it. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found. And if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating, as it is the best way to help other people find us. 100% of donations to the show are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about this week's guest and how you can support the show, please visit thebadroman.com. Thank you.